thank you everybody very much for taking part in that poll. I will now pass over to Ruth Hughes. Thank you, Ruth. Good afternoon. Um, uh, is the I can still see the poll, Joe. Is it possible to take is that take on screen? Down. Could you take it down from my screen too, please? I've taken it down, yep. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm afraid I can still see it, Joe, on my screen, and that's preventing me from looking at my slides. Ruth, if you click the X in the corner, it will delete it. Thanks so much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to watch Arabella and me undertake a basic introduction to tax. Arabella is our pupil at the moment, and she'll be our junior tenant in uh, October, so you can look forward to instructing her soon. Good afternoon, Arabella. Good afternoon. Uh, so Arabella will be posing questions uh, to me about inheritance tax, which I will be seeking to answer. Uh, I just wanted to use this opportunity to say thank you very much to my referees because I found out yesterday that I am uh, rated in Chambers and Partners high net worth for private client tax. So great thank you to everyone who gave me references. I'm really delighted about that. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so bear that in mind if you want to ask questions. Uh, which we will take at the end. I don't promise to be able to answer all the questions about any tax that might arise, but I may give some of them a go. But there's a question and answer box you can use. If you prefer to be anonymous, you can tick the box that says anonymous so that your uh, question isn't attributed to you personally. Uh, the audience for this webinar is quite a mixed audience. There may be some students, some new uh, private client practitioners, some contentious practitioners and some more experienced um, non-contentious private client practitioners. So if you are a complete uh, beginner for uh, IHT, then it may be quite a lot for you to take in, but the slides will be available afterwards. If you already have a strong advisory practice, this will be more of a refresher for you, but there may be some interesting points that arise uh, from uh, the talk and do feel free to ask questions and it may be especially helpful if you're a contentious practitioner who wishes they had a understanding of basic inheritance tax for when those tricky issues come up when settling for example inheritance tax uh, inheritance act disputes uh, for example, I had a court of protection case uh, last year where we managed to deal with the difficult issue of P having married his uh, carer by uh, using the benefit of that marriage to uh, put in a spousal life interest and hopefully t save about £5 million of inheritance tax. So it can be very useful having a structured settlement. So. Here we're starting off with uh, Benjamin Franklin's famous quote, quote, nothing in this world can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And today we're dealing with both death and taxes in one uh, fell swoop with the inheritance tax. But it's really a talk of two halves. The first will deal with the incident of tax on death and the second half will deal with potentially exempt transfers, uh, IHG in the context of trusts and lifetime settlements. And uh, the whole area is not that easy to make lighthearted but uh, Arabella and I will do our best and for example we have a beautiful picture of Leo the tax cat because he's my pet and he's actually sitting next to me helping with the talk right now. Um, so uh, without further ado let's begin. So I know it's the way we've structured our talk to make it easier to follow, but is it actually too simplistic to silo IHT into those two camps of deaths and trusts? Yes, it is. And you might be uh, surprised to learn that there is IHT not on death if you're a complete beginner to inheritance tax, because the clue is not in the name, uh, because there can be immediately chargeable transfers, um, which are either charged at lifetime or uh, death rates, potentially exempt transfers, more about those later, or exempt transfers. So you have to take into account the three types of transfer that you might have. And it is too simplistic to divide it into the two camps, but it's a bit like um, chemistry. Uh, I think some you get taught uh, things that are slightly uh, basic, but not entirely accurate to begin with. And then when you get more advanced, you find out that things are a bit more complicated, but we're going to put them in those two halves to structure the talk. Great. So first of all, what counts as a chargeable transfer? 
Well, that's quite an easy question because there's an answer to that in section 2.1 of the Act, which is the Inheritance Tax Act 1984, which is the main statute involved in inheritance tax, not the only statute, but the main statute. And it says any transfer of value which is made to an individual but is not an exempt transfer. So any transfer of value made to an individual but not exempt. Great. Um, and could you explain what the loss to donor principle is in the context of transfers for value? So the loss to donor principle is really important um, because uh, it's uh, 3.1 of the Act says that a disposition made by a person as a result of which the value of his estate immediately after the transfer is less than it would have been but for the disposition. And it's really this loss to donor principle that uh, um, governs whether or not there is a transfer of value. So um, it may be that I make a transfer to you that is a very valuable to you, but has caused my estate not to lose very much, maybe because of the marriage value to land that you have. So that's not gonna be a large transfer of value or in respect of my estate. But if the opposite is true, and I give something away that looks like it's only a small value, but actually it's a ransom strip, and it means that I can't get onto uh, other of my land and that's going to be a really large transfer of value to me even though it's not a great benefit to you. That's a helpful example. What about excluded property? So um, there isn't, no account is taken of excluded property that's section six of the act but what is excluded property well that's uh, a good example of that is a remainder interest under a trust so if you have a life interest for widow and remainder to the children the children's interest before it falls in is excluded and no account of taken of it and also another example of excluded property is non-uk situs assets owned by a non-domiciled a person who's not domiciled for IHT purposes. So that's all excluded for, from the IHT net. Mm -hmm. And um, failure to exercise rights, isn't there an ongoing case about that right now? Yeah, so that's right. So you might find that some property falls within your estate for inheritance tax purposes if you could have called it in to your estate, but you chose not to before you die. And our colleagues Hugh Cumber and David Rees QC are currently litigating about uh, that issue in relation to a pension in a case called Staveley. And they argued that in Michaelmas and the Supreme Court hasn't handed down a decision yet. So that's uh, very um, keenly awaited. So thanks for explaining transfers of value. I suppose the key question is, is there a transfer of value when someone dies? Sort of, Arabella. What happens is that immediately before your death, you're treated as making a transfer of value equal to the value of your estate at that time immediately before death. That's section 4.1. And speaking of estates, what, what is a person's estate for IHT purposes? So the estate for IHT purposes is the aggregate of all the property which a deceased person is beneficially entitled to immediately before death, apart from certain kinds of interests in possession, we'll get to that later, uh, and excluded property. And I can see on the side that it says liabilities of the estate are generally deducted on death. Is that always the case? When is no. it? Um, so there are some provisions in relation to artificial debts um, that prevent those artificial debts uh, being uh, included in the liabilities for the purpose of calculating the estate for inheritance tax. And there are also exemptions in relation to the purchase liabilities created for the purchase of exempt property and agricultural and business property uh, in the Finance Act 2013. So we've mentioned two new pieces of legislation here, the Finance Act 1986 and the Finance Act 2013, and they're both relevant to this issue. And so does this all mean that a person's estate could include property that they don't actually own? So yes, it can do. Um, so for example, where a person has a qualifying interest in possession, and we'll get to the meaning of qualifying interest in possession later, then they're treated as owning uh, that all the property, even though they have uh, only a life interest in it. So for example, if I have um, an interest uh, in a house that's been left to me by my deceased husband, and then I'll be treated as owning the whole of the property, 
uh, um, for inheritance tax purposes and not just a valuation of the life interest. And there are also reservation of benefit provisions in the um, inherit in the Finance Act 1986, particularly section 102 um, um, to 103, which provide that if I retain an interest in property that I have given away, that's a reservation of benefit and that reservation property in which I have um, kept a benefit in has um, is treated as being part of my estate for inheritance tax purposes. And that's um, the case whether or not I have uh, reserved a small benefit or a large benefit. So I might have given you my house, uh, Arabella, and I've decided not to live in it anymore. And uh, I occasionally use it um, for staying in London when I need to come into London for a trial, say, that I might only have a limited use of the property, but I'm treated as uh, reserving a benefit in the whole unless I pay um, consideration for that. And uh, also note, there's another piece of legislation, which is the Finance Act 2005, which uh, creates the pre-owned assets tax, which is relevant too. Um, the pre-owned asset tax, a kind of inheritance tax? So yes and no, Arabella. It, it is really a kind of inheritance tax. And one of the strong clues to that is that the... Um, explanation of the tax in HMRC's manual is found in uh, the um, inheritance tax manual and the inheritance tax manual is a great place to look if you want to get some guidance about what HMRC think about uh, their taxes uh, but actually technically it's a charge to income tax what it's doing is it's a, a kind of targeted uh, anti-avoidance rule aimed at people who are trying to avoid the reservation of benefit rules using uh, what's kind of known as shearing screams. And there are a number of important cases uh, in inheritance tax called Melville and Ingram and Evershed. And they're to do with these schemes where um, people have tried to give away part of their house, not, not like the living room, um, but you know, an interest in the future like a leasehold interest that comes in in the future, for example, in their home, but living in the home. And HMRC became very upset that these sort of shearing schemes were um, being entered into and were being held to work by the court. So they introduced this targeted uh, anti-avoidance rule, which is important to bear in mind when you have um, also a reservation of benefit problem. But I would say that in general, the question is often, is there a reservation of benefit? Or, and if there is a reservation of benefit, there won't be a pre-owned assets tax charge. And if there isn't a reservation of benefit, generally there won't be a pre-owned assets tax charge unless you're within the sort of, exactly the kind of schemes that uh, HMRC were trying to hit with the pre-owned assets tax. Hmm, good to know. So in, in really basic terms, how do you work out what the charge on death is? We need to value the property uh, that we've just been mentioning altogether, and you need to find it, get an open market valuation of that. You find the open market principle in section 160 of the Inheritance Tax Act. You're going to be able to take off that value uh, any business and agricultural property or woodland that might be reduced in value either to 100% or 50% for the purposes of the Act. You're going to be able to deduct the nil rate band and uh, you might be able to deduct some exemptions that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the nil rate band is £325,000 uh, at the moment and has been for a very long time since I started in practice. No, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't. <laughs> Is there more than one nil rate band? Yes, confusingly, there are a number of nil rate bands now. Uh, there's not only your own nil rate band, but you have a transferable nil rate band between spouses. So a married couple have up to £650,000 between them. And there's also the residential nil rate band, which um, has relatively recently been introduced which is very complicated and I've said there be dragons and that's partly because I well, have another talk about uh, the residential nil rate band which I do by reference to Game of Thrones. <laughs> well maybe you could do a really quick answer on how the residential nil rate band came about. Yeah so what happened was that um, 
the Conservative Party wanted to win the um, 2015 election and one of their ideas was um, to increase the nil rate ban and there was talk of increasing there has been talk of increasing the nil rate ban to just the regular nil rate ban to about a million pounds for some time but what this actually does is was George Osborne seeking to give allow parents to give more of their property to their children because it was felt that unfair that as the nil rate band hadn't um, increased in value property prices especially in London but generally had increased over uh, that time frame a huge amount and people wanted to be able to leave their own their own home to their children without it having to be sold for tax purposes so that's sort of the purpose of the nil rate band. I know you've said um, there are complicated rules about the residential nil rate band. How straightforward is it to work out how to structure an estate in light of those rules? Well, in my view, it's really difficult, but, and that's for two reasons. One, the level of the residential nil rate band is not fixed. It started off as £100,000 per person, and you can have a married couple having two. It's now at £175,000 per person, and like I said, you can have two. And after this year, it's going to increase in relation to the consumer price index. So you're all going to have to get your consumer price index tables out in order to work out what actual uh, double Nil rate, uh, residential nil rate band is actually available so that's a nightmare uh, to predict when you're planning and also um, there's a taper threshold so the taper threshold is now at two million pounds it used to be at one million pound but now it's at two million pounds and for every two pounds that a uh, uh, test data has over the two million pound threshold the residential nil rate band reduces by one pound so working out what's available uh, is really difficult before when at the planning stage mm -hmm. so should you perhaps be advising people to make deathbed gifts in order to make best use of the residential nil rate band so this is a strategy that can be used, uh, particularly if you have uh, testators that have a large amount over the, um, the, the taper threshold of £2 million in their estate. Um, obviously, it's tricky making deathbed gifts. You're going to want to work out, and we'll talk about pets later, what the impact of the fact that you're making a lifetime uh, gift that's not going to survive seven years, likely, uh, on the um, estate. But that it can be a benefit. Um, but you want to take care. I mean, you're going to, it's dangerous. It could defeat the impact of someone's will. Uh, they might not have capacity. All these things might be quite difficult. Um, HMRC might not, ch uh, might challenge the gifts if they think that someone lacked capacity. And um, what do the downsizing provisions have to do with the residential mill rate band? Well, the thing is, you don't actually have to have a house to give to your children in order to make use of the residential the, uh, nil rate ban. Because if I need to sell my house to go into a nursing home, that's the, the residential nil rate ban still going to be available to me. But the downsizing provisions make the, re the rest of the residential nil rate ban look uh, simple to use. So they're extremely complicated. But just to note for this purpose of this relatively basic talk that th there's no time period that the downsizing has to take place during so you might want to get property uh, colleagues to keep records of the amount that properties have sold for so that they, those records can be provided to HMRC in the future when you want to claim the residential no rate band. So downsizing provisions useful but complicated. Yeah. Um, I've also heard that these provisions can be used by non-domiciliaries. Is that right? Yes, that's right. The, uh, the residential nil rate band taper threshold takes into account uh, property, but not that's in your estate for IHT purposes, so no excluded property. So imagine you have uh, a, a non-dom with a £2 million flat um, in uh, central London, you probably still can get one for that nowadays, especially with COVID-19. Um, they can use the benefit of the residential nil rate band. Uh, I'm not sure that were the, they were the necessarily the people that um, George Osborne were intending in to benefit, um, but they are because all of the rest of their estate, which might be very large, is excluded property. So they can benefit from the nil rate uh, residential nil rate band, even though the whole of their assets might be much larger than the taper threshold. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks. So that's residential nil rate bans. Um, could you now Ruth, just run us through the main exemptions to IHT in general? Yes, yeah, so the spouse exemptions, so gifts to my husband or wife, charity exemptions, but note there's limitations to which charities, particularly overseas charities, can be problematic. There's an annual exemption of £3,000 a year. Small gifts come out uh, of account if they're less than £250. Gifts with surplus income is useful. This is here because if I make a commitment to making gifts out of income that I don't need for my own um, inc uh, income maintenance purposes, then that's um, exempt completely from IHT and it's a good planning technique. Um, that's because it's thought that that property has already been taxed to income tax and oughtn't to be taxed to IHT as well gifts in consideration of marriage and gifts to political parties and there have been some fun cases about um, um, really small political parties like which um, don't have enough MPs to qualify under section 24 and Aaron Banks making complaints about how his gifts um, weren't uh, considered to be uh, relieved for IHT purposes so uh, that's quite interesting if you can get involved in one of those cases. Um, but spousal um, exemptions are an, often a great place for planning, particularly if you are dealing with an Inheritance Act claim, uh, and we'll come back to that later. Again, gifts out of surplus income, I often see this in uh, court of protection cases where gifts are being blessed by the court. Um, and uh, the charity exemption can also be an important thing to bear in mind if you're structuring a uh, settlement of a contentious probate claim, because uh, if you have one charity beneficiary and another non-charity beneficiary, you might be able to make use of having one charity beneficiary to get exempted on the entire uh, estate. What about people who come from abroad but have moved to the UK and lived here for a long time, say 50 years, do they have to pay UK IHT? Basically, yes. Um, normally. In, from the 6th of April 2017, the uh, UK uh, IHT deemed domicile, if you, the person might have got, obtained a UK domicile of choice, but if they haven't um, obtained a UK domicile of choice, then they only need 15 out of 20 years of tax residence here to be deemed domicile, if they're not, um, even if they're not resident. So they might have moved away um, before the 20 year period uh, elapses and they uh, would therefore <laughs> nevertheless be liable for UK IHT if 15 out of the 20 years they'd been living in the UK so that's moved down from 17 years previously and there's um, more strict rules for people who were formerly domiciled in the UK and their court if they uh, come back and are resident for at least one out of two previous tax years. Hmm. So is deemed domicile for IHT purposes pretty much always going to apply to people who fall into this category? So there is some uh, exceptions in the double tax treaties and um, that you might find they prefer actual domicile to deemed domicile. Uh, that's certainly the case in the Indian uh, double tax treaty, but all the double, there aren't double tax treaties with every country and they are often subtly different so it's definitely worth checking the particular double tax treaty uh, that you have um, uh, if one applies um, because there are some differences. Thanks. So moving on from domicile, is it possible to change the IHT position after a person's died and if so how does that work? Yes, so it is possible for tax purposes to rearrange the estate and there are some uh, other rules that apply to this which are listed on the slide. If you have uh, deaths in quick succession that may change the IHT rules. The big one is deeds of variation. Um, so uh, you can, within two years of death, you can change the direction of property and that will be read back to death for tax purposes. So if I've given uh, my daughter uh, or my estate, um, then my husband, uh, and she wants to give some to her father, my husband, uh, she can do uh, so, and he, 
they can take the benefit or he can take the benefit of the spouse exemption. If you have a minor child and there's a, a tax um, saving scheme you want to put in, usually putting in some kind of life interest for a, um, a widow or widower, you might need the court, well, you will need the court, uh, the Chancery Division to give their blessing to that under the Variation of Trusts Act which um, is something worth exploring. Uh, the other main uh, use is the section 144 appointment. So if you have a trust where there's no qualifying interest in possession that's previously uh, existed, and we'll get into what that means later, then you can appoint out within two years and have that read back to the date of death. So a uh, classic example is a discretionary trust made by the deceased. Um, and one of the beneficiaries is you, Arabella, and the trustees can make it an absolute appointment to you and that will be read back to death and there won't um, be treated any discretionary trust in the interim for tax purposes. Very useful. There's also claims under the Inheritance Act where there's a great provision, which is section 146 of the Inheritance Tax Act, which allows you to read back the court's order to uh, the date of death. Uh, this is good for two reasons. It often means you can put in a spousal life interest, but it, even better if you've got a spousal life interest over the entire estate, which you want to terminate in part, you can terminate it without there being a potentially exempt transfer or a, uh, ch a lifetime chargeable transfer for the uh, widow at that stage. So you can effectively get all the property out of the estate um, that's not going to the spouse um, without any IHT at all. So it's a nothing for IHT purposes. That's a great trick. Hmm. Speaking of other possible tricks, back to deeds of variation. Is there scope for settling a probate dispute with a deed of variation and using that potential tax saving as a bargaining chip? Well, that's a lot more difficult, actually, because that's probably external consideration for the purposes of the deed of variation. You can use a deed of variation instead of making a claim under the 1975 Act, because HMRC have a concession which suggests that uh, making a deed of variation to settle an Inheritance Act claim is an external consideration, but they don't have the same kind of... Um, a concession for other kinds of probate claims. So whether or not that's really consideration uh, for the purpose of section 142 is, is a bit questionable, but uh, I would be cautious um, in that regard. Mm. Thanks. So that's the first half of the talk about IHT on death, and it has just flown by. We're now into the second half, which is IHT on lifetime gifts and trusts. We're going to start by talking about potentially exempt transfers, but in, in order to do that, I thought it would be useful, Ruth, if you could explain what types of transfers of value there are in general. So, there are, so like we said, there were exempt transfers, uh, chargeable transfers, um, for example, the transfer of value that happens on death, uh, but also some lifetime chargeable transfers, and uh, transfers that could be exempt, uh, but might not be. They might become chargeable and they're called potentially exempt transfers or PETs and they operate only in the context of lifetime dispositions. So classic example of a PET would be I give uh, a million pounds to you Arabella, I survive for 10 years uh, and then I die. There's no inheritance tax on that. Um, that's completely exempt. So, but if I died after five years, there would be some inheritance tax. Uh, so though it's potentially exempt, um, a better word for it might really be potentially chargeable, but that's not what the uh, legislation says. Mm. Um, I can see that there are some regulations on the side there. What do they do? So this is really just to let you know that they exist. These are the Inheritance Tax Double Charge Relief Regulations 1987 and there can be some difficulties particularly with regard to the calculation of tra um, tax if uh, I make a potentially exempt transfer that fails but it's also a gift with reservation uh, so maybe that house that I was using that I gave to you I die after five years and there's a reservation of benefit and a failed pet how do you deal with the two regimes well you don't get charged twice and that's what's dealt with in the double charges relief regulations but I mean the basic principle is that the larger amount is charged mm-hmm 
So what actually is the definition of a pet? So this is in section 3A1A of the Inheritance Tax Act. A pet is a transfer of value made by an individual which would not be chargeable other than this section uh, and to the extent it constitutes a gift to another person uh, or into a disabled person's trusts. So uh, you now you used to be able to have a pet into a, um, a discretionary trust, for example, but now you can't. The only trust you can make a pet into are disabled person's interest trusts. Um, and uh, section 3A4 shows that uh, a pet is exempt if it uh, is made seven years before the death. Uh, and uh, any other pets, i.e. failed pets, are chargeable transfers. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that it's section 3A is a bit surprising because it's surely quite a key definition. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, this is my segue into a short history of inheritance tax. So inheritance tax actually, uh, the first kind of inheritance tax we had was a probate duty introduced in 1694. There was then a state duty, which is actually the... Uh, for example, a lot of the gift with reservation case law comes under estate duty. That was introduced in 1884. That survived for a long time, 100 years of estate duty. And we had capital transfer tax by the um, Labour government in, nine, uh, not quite so, not quite 100 years actually, in 1975. Uh, so um, just over 90 years of estate duty. Uh, and that capital transfer tax was really a gifting tax rather than an inheritance tax because you had a nil rate ban for your whole life and any gifts made um, uh, over that nil rate ban were chargeable even if they were lifetime transfers whether or not that you died within seven years or not and that was all consolidated into the tra capital transfer tax 1984 which is actually what we now have as the inheritance tax act 1984 but it was renamed by the finance act 1986 and that the then uh, thatcher government uh, and thatcher was actually a pupil in our chambers and sometimes would refer to herself as a tax lawyer so uh, that's quite interesting you can see references to her saying well i'm a tax lawyer and this is um what i think about some tax um so uh, that the, the Finance Act um, 1986 renamed uh, the Capital Transfer Tax 1984, the Inheritance Tax Act 1984, and introduced this concept of pets to allow gifts to be made, um, which could, if you survive long enough, be exempt, and also the, those gifts with reservation rules um, to stop uh, avoidance. So that is why we have Section 3A as such an important section within our concept of inheritance uh, tax. Thanks. It's, it's those details that we crave. <laughs> um, when it comes to pets, seven years is obviously the key figure. Um, but what happens if someone does make a pet and doesn't manage to survive seven years after? So um, the nil rate band always applies itself to the um, potentially exempt transfer first. But if you die after the first three uh, years, you don't get any benefit from your pet but there are tapering provisions between year three and year seven. So you can get some benefit if your transfer is over the nil rate band. Mm -hmm. um, and is it even possible to make a transfer of value that doesn't become a pet? Yeah, so you can make lifetime chargeable transfers and that's really gifts into trust. Uh, they cause an immediate charge to tax. Um, and um, the, they also take the benefit of the nil rate band. Uh, so if I make a £300,000 gift into a discretionary trust, I won't get charged tax today because I have that nil rate band. Um, but if I uh, make a gift of £350,000, then assuming I have no uh, nil rate band, uh, I have a foreign nil rate band available, uh, that's only the £25,000 excess that will be charged. There's lifetime rates of 20%, but if um, you die within seven years, they'll get recharged at the death rate, which is 70%. Mm -hmm. um, so you've confirmed that you can use your nil rate band. What yeah. about that double nil rate band, the transferable one? Uh, yes, yeah, so you can't use that for lifetime rates. I actually have a case uh, at the moment about a mistake that happened because someone thought you could put £650,000 into trust because there was a double nil rate band available. But no, just the first, uh, just your nil rate band, not the double nil rate band. Mm -hmm. And while we're on it, what about the residential nil rate band? 
No, that's not available either. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe take us through an example of a lifetime chargeable transfer? Yes, yeah, so I have uh, decided to use as my example Rishi. He's our favourite uh, waiter at the moment. So uh, he's going to be uh, the person in our example. And he's got a full nil rate band at all relevant times. He's made no chargeable transfers in the previous uh, seven years. And he settles £300,000 on trust. There's no IHT payable because the whole gift is within the nil rate band. But later, some time later, he makes a further gift of £300,000 into trust. Uh, he only has £25,000 of nil right ban left, and the, so the remainder, the £275,000, is chargeable at lifetime rates. That's 20%. So there's a £55,000 charge, which Rishi has to pay uh, straight up. And there's a, there's a possible accumulation with the nil rate band um, every seven years. So you, get, you can get a new one every seven years, but you have to be careful if there's a failed pet because you can end up looking back up to 14 years. Hmm. Thanks. So while we're back to pets, obviously everyone wants their pet to succeed. Um, but what if, what if it does fail? What then? Well, uh, then uh, the, the um, potentially exempt char transfer becomes chargeable. There's no tax uh, at the time, but when the pet fails because you die, you have to look at uh, that there's a chargeable transfer that comes into the regime. So, uh, like I said, it takes the benefit of the nil rate band. Um, at, um, what that was at the time of transfer, but to the extent that the pet exceeds the nil rate band, you get charged death rates uh, on the transfer of value that the pet represents. And you may need to recalculate um, chargeable transfers that have happened after the pet um, that's failed as well. So that's a further complication. Or mm -hmm. well, it'd be useful if you could take us through another example of that kind of situation. Yeah, so Rishi, again, he's got his uh, full nil rate band available and he makes a pet in year one of £400,000. So he's not got to pay himself a chance for any money at that point. But then he makes a chargeable transfer, so a gift into a discretionary trust, let's say, of £325,000 in year two. Again, no, um, no charge to tax then because he's got a fully available nil rate band. But in year three, oh no, he dies. And the pet becomes chargeable using the whole of the nil rate band because it's over £325,000. So the tax in respect of the lifetime chargeable transfer, the discretionary trust, has to be recalculated because we are assumed that there was a full nil rate band but it turns out actually the pet has used all the nil rate band so that charge gets increased and um, at death rates as well. Mm. Thanks. So um, we promised to do trusts as well as death um, and, and we definitely still have time for it so why don't we start with you Ruth telling us what a settlement is for IHT purposes. So there's a specific bespoke definition of settlement in the Inheritance Tax Act, Section 43. And so you look at this and not just think, oh, gosh, there's a trust, but because a bear trust, for example, is not a settlement for IHT. Uh, and it means any disposition whereby property is held for the time being uh, for persons in succession or subject to a contingency, e.g. a life interest um, or... Uh, uh, if I hold it for someone um, until uh, and uh, if they uh, on a contingency like obtaining 25, which is often the case in um, or will trusts and uh, that's held by trustees on trust to or held by trustees on trust to accumulate uh, with power to make payments out, e.g. a discretionary trust um, is also where property is charged with the payment of an annuity. And this is pretty rare to see nowadays, but it it used to be the case that people were left annuities by um, will and the, so the um, whole of the property that the annuity is charged with is a, a settlement for the purposes of the uh, Inheritance Tax Act, which makes make putting an annuity in your will really, really unattractive. And I definitely advise you not to do it. It's a nightmare. And settled property is construed accordingly to the definition of settlement. Great stuff. We love a bespoke definition. Um, so if we think back to the 22nd of March 2006, 
back when my MP3 player and my Bieber account were cutting edge tech. It obviously feels like a long time ago now, but it's still a key date for IHT. Why is that? Yeah, that's right. So I was still at law school in March 2006, uh, but it is a really key date for inheritance tax because it for trusts that exist before 2006, if they have an interest in possession in them, uh, that interest in possession is treated very differently uh, to how it is treated now. So the old definition was between interest in possession trusts and non-interest in possession trusts, really discretionary trusts. And previously, the interest in possession trusts were affected taxed as if they were held by the life tenant uh, um, as owning the whole beneficial interest in the settled property which is one of the examples I gave right at the very beginning um, uh, and so that settled property effectively formed part of the life tenants estate for IHT purposes and other trusts that one didn't have an interest in possession in them which were taxed as part of the relevant property regime. So what's the relevant property regime? Is there an irrelevant property regime? No, there's no irrelevant property regime. The relevant property regime is a shame. I wish the draftman had had a bit more uh, um, flair calling the interest in possession non-relevant property. Um, but yes, so the relevant property regime is just a way of uh, the government taxing trust because it's much more difficult to tax trust than it is to track tax absolute interest in property because it's not really clear who owns them so that's what the relevant property regime is it's a way of uh, the government taxing trusts hmm. um and how is relevant property charged uh, so um i'm just going to get on to that in a second but i just thought i'd uh, point out um that um before March 2006, settled property was, I say, treated as part of the life tenants estate. Um, in that case, there was no uh, lifetime chargeable transfers during the interest in possession. And so that meant that uh, when your interest in possession terminated, you generally made a pet or it could be an immediately chargeable transfer if you were going in, the property was going into a discretionary trust. You could convert an interest in possession to an absolute interest, i.e. by appointing out to the life tenant, and that would be IHT neutral because it was treated as being within the um, life tenants estate before and then it actually was in the life tenants estate um, and you accumulated the settled property with the life tenants free property for the purpose of calculating the charge to test to tax and that was a relatively benign taxing stru structure whereas the relevant property regime um, involves 10-year charges um, and uh, exit charges, as well as the lifetime chargeable transfer on the way in. So um, that's how relevant property is uh, still uh, charged. But the real substantial difference is that now m most uh, trusts are within the relevant property regime, whereas previously uh, most trusts, unless they were uh, pure discretionary trusts, were uh, outside the relevant property regime. Mm, thanks. Yeah, so to give a bit more detail about the rates of charge to tax, we've looked at the lifetime rates of 20% over the nil rate band on the way in, um, the benefit of the nil rate band, uh, the, there's a maximum effective rate in respect of the 10 year charges and the exit charges of 6%. Um, and the exit charge is like a fraction of the 10 year period you've been in. And there is, um, there is possible to get property out of a, a discretionary trust without any charge to tax, which is in the first three months in the first period, um, you, you can do that. But um, I mean, it's pretty rare that you want to because why would you have put it in just to take it out again but you can do that but do note there's a trap there for capital gains tax purposes where uh, most of the time if you have a charge to IHT you won't have a charge to CGT but the fact that you don't get a charge to IHT then there may cause a CGT charge. Mm -hmm. So the reason um, 
that this uh, all happened was really because the Labour government in 2006 on budget day decided that they were going to try and reduce the number of trusts which that favourable benign um, interest in possession regime applied. So they wanted to reduce the number of um, IOP trusts benefiting um, and that that is why the 22nd of March is the key day because that was budget day and interest in possession that existed before uh, the, um, the budget day retain their old characteristics, but not new interest in possession trusts, which are relevant property trusts in general. Thanks. That context is always really useful to understanding tax, I find. Um, what have the practical effects of the 2006 changes been? So for a trust lawyer, it's actually been really sad because previously there were accumulation and maintenance settlements, which were really common, good way of passing um, uh, money to grandchildren at 25, uh, favourable trust treatment. And that really has cut down the number of new uh, lifetime trusts that have been set up because it used to be that you could set up a trust as a pet and then there would be no charge if you survive for seven years but now you know they're going to suffer the entry charge the periodic charge the exit charge um, and so that's pretty unattractive for some people uh, so that sort of limits what you can put in sensibly to, to lifetime settlements um, BPR property and APR property can still be attractive and settlements are set up by will um, as well. So uh, particularly disabled persons trusts and um, they can be set up at the moment um, in their lifetime. They're quite attractive, particularly actually now you can accumulate um, income for the lifetime of a whole trust. So disabled persons interest can be quite attractive as a trust planning mechanism if you've got a disabled beneficiary you want to benefit them and also on death um, those interest in possession for spouses which we'll come on to they are often used too so it's really meant that there's fewer trusts less trust disputes onshore and most of the interesting cases are now more offshore but offshore is definitely outside the scope of the basic tax course yeah um, so you mentioned qualifying interests in possession earlier. What makes an IIP a qualifying IIP? So they are listed in uh, Section 49 of the Inheritance Tax Act. Uh, and uh, there are really three important types. The immediate post-death interest, so that one for the surviving spouse I've been talking about, call that an IPD, a disabled person's interest uh, trust, their favoured um, and the transitional serial interest, the TSI. Oh, I think you're going to have to clue us up on all the acronyms. Um, let's start with IPD. Yes, so I, I'll often talk about an IPD. Uh, uh, and it, as the name suggests, it has to be created by will or intestacy. And I looked at this yesterday, I thought, gosh, how does an intestacy create an IPD? And then it, I reminded myself that it, in the past, it's been possible for someone to die intestate and their spouse to get a life interest in uh, half of residue. So those uh, life interest from old intestacies are IPDs and the beneficiary must become entitled to the like the life interest immediately upon death of the testator or the uh, intestate so that's what an IPD is. Um, what, what on earth is a TSI? <laughs> Yeah, what on earth is a TSI? So TSIs were really, really hip when I first joined Five Stone Buildings and everyone was replacing their old uh, style A&Ms with new interest in possession trust because there was a transitional period that went up to the 5th of October 2008 where if you, you could create a new transitional serial interest that even though it started after March of 20, uh, 22nd 2006 would still be an old style uh, life interest for the purposes of taxation so that so one kind is that kind of um, interest in possession created between March the 22nd and the 5th of October and there's still lots of those around because everybody went into changing their trust to do that at the time and but the only new transitional serial interest you can really create there's something to do with 
um, uh, life insurance plans as well. But apart from that, the only new ones you can create are if you have the death of an old interest in possession beneficiary, and then their civil partner or spouse is the new interest in possession beneficiary. And this can be a useful planning tool because you can often use uh, powers of uh, advancement to um, advance a life interest under the uh, old interest in possession interest to create a new spousal life interest, particularly if you have, for example, a new spouse. And I actually have a VTA going on at the moment where we are um, create, putting in place uh, the mechanism to create uh, some transitional serial interests uh, underneath the old IIP. Hmm. So can it be said that any trust you'll ever come across will either be qualifying interest in possession now or relevant property settlements? Um, well, there's actually a third kind of favoured regime, which is not often used, but is there. So I am going to tell you about it. It's not that attractive. It used to be more attractive. Those A&M trusts used to be sort of part of this favoured regime. Uh, they exist for bereaved minor trusts, including those ones that, uh, that can arise in intestacy that benefit uh, the minor at 18. Uh, and Section 71D trusts, which are Section 18 to 25 trusts. And uh, they are, I've, I've not been ever asked to set one up, but I have been asked to vary them um, so as to avoid a trust, uh, a, tax, a tax charge on their closure at, when the beneficiary becomes 25. Uh, and sometimes you can need a VTA to do that because it will uh, affect the minors and unborns' interests. So sometimes you will see VTAs that are um, associated with Section 71D trusts. Thanks. Um, so we've heard loads about IHT now and we've loved all of it, but bottom line, once you've worked out how much is owed, who is the person or entity that actually pays the IHT that's due? So uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, in light of the complex nature of the tax, the answer is also complicated. And there are provisions in section 199 to section 214 of the Inheritance Tax Act setting this out. And they are set for primary and secondary uh, liabilities. Uh, and it really depends on what's happened uh, to cause the tax to be due. So if there's a lifetime chargeable transfer, it might be the transferor. If it's a, uh, on the death, it might be the PRs. It could be a transferee or the trustees or the person in whom the property is vested beneficially or otherwise, uh, and also beneficiaries of a trust. So there's lots of different rules uh, and they're all set out in section 119 and following of the Inheritance Tax Act. So not even that question has a simple answer. Um, <laughs> some of that sounds a bit unfair though. Are there any remedies for you if you've paid tax as a secondary person and it turns out that someone else should have paid it before you? Yeah, in theory there are. And Emily Campbell at Wilberforce Chambers wrote a really brilliant article about this in Private Client Business. And what she suggests is that there's likely to be a restitutionary remedy against the person who should have paid the tax if you have paid it as a secondary person. Trustees also will have a lien against their uh, the assets in the trust uh, usually, so they'll be able to claw money back through their lien. And actually the lien can be super useful because if you've got a tax mistake case and you want to, uh, and somehow there's a problem with you bringing it because there's no obvious issue between the parties, sometimes you can manufacture an issue between the parties. Um, uh, and Penny talked about that in her um uh, re rectification talk about a case she did called Re Graham. Uh, so that Lien can be quite useful. Great. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but finally, it might just be useful if you could really briefly explain where the IHT lit litigation is focused right now. So when I first started in practice, there was more litigation in the agricultural uh, property area, talking about farmhouses and were they really farmhouses and how much of them was really a farmhouse. Um, but I think things have moved on and often I see litigation now focused on those kind of reservation of benefit issues, the kind of Ingram schemes, but the new generation of Ingram schemes. So there's been a number of cases on that, one called Bazzoni, one last year called Hood, uh, and there's been a double trust scheme come up this year as well. So they're quite rare inheritance tax cases coming to court uh, or the tribunal, but yeah, it seems to be mostly in those uh, reservation of benefit areas. And you can see in Staveley that I mentioned earlier, there's maybe a bit more um, 
aggression on the part of the uh, capital taxes part of um, HMRC as well and that's also um, going to give us an answer on what associated operations means in the IHT context so that's really interesting. Yeah it's also good to know that the Supreme Court also take their time when thinking about tax <laughs> that comes out. Um, really quickly we've got two minutes left what about IHT avoidance? So just to mention that the, there is a GAR there, the general anti-avoidance rule, and you do have to take it account in Inheritance Act cases too. Uh, there's also IHT DOTAS with the IHT DOTAS specific hallmarks. So I just wanted to mention them in passing so you know what they are. It's not a lot of help, the guidance uh, on GAR in respect of IHT and the DOTAS guidance, but because um, they really tell you that things that are very vanilla are obviously vanilla and things that look quite dodgy uh, are, might be a problem. Um, so um, I think it's definitely what I think there was, uh, I don't know whether um, haven't looked this up, but there was some suggestion that there was a IHT case going to the GAR committee. So um, that there might be some more information available on that. Hmm. Well, so, thank you so much. So I think that we might have some, um, uh, questions, um, some of which might be um, uh, more easy to um, answer than others. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, try and answer some of the questions. We don't have time to answer all of them, I'm afraid. So uh, one question is: Is there a way to vary a revocable life interest? And I would think that there would often be a way to vary the revocable life interest uh, by using the power of revocation. And there might, there's likely to be um, powers of advancements and appointments within the um, uh, um, trust which allow you to do that. So I would think that there is likely to be a, um, a way of revoke, uh, dealing with that. Um, And someone's asked an interesting question about uh, a lifetime gift of a capital investment on an uh, investment property, but with the right to income from the investment uh, not being a gift with reservation by reason of Section 102B of the Finance Act 1986. That's Barry Abrams. That's a really good question. And um, so I know that my, uh, I've had colleagues do this a lot. And one of the, there aren't, I mean, a, the, this is one of the schemes where I know other, I haven't thought about it in detail, but one of my uh, colleagues has questioned whether it might fall within the GAR, the general anti-avoidance rule. My feeling is that it probably doesn't, but that is a, um, a type of planning that uh, ought to work. So thanks very much, Barry, for that quite interesting question about um, investment properties. Um, and I might have to, I have, some of these questions are a bit more difficult than I'm able to just give an answer to, but I might set, be able to um, think about it a little bit and send out some uh, answers um, later if that would be useful or if uh, we can make a note of the people that have made the answers and uh, questions and I can send back. If you have an anonymous question and some of these questions are anonymous, uh, please feel free to email us at marketing at 5sblaw.com uh, or me at rhughes at 5sblaw.com to, to get a personal answer. So um, I think uh, that it will be possible to provide some answers, I hope, but unfortunately we've run uh, a bit over time, so I don't want to keep you here any longer. So thanks ever so much, Arabella, for um, posing those questions to me. Hey, thank you, Ruth. Great to hear your hot take on IHT. Thanks very much. And uh, as I said, there'll be a recording available if you want to share the introduction with any colleagues. Great. Bye, everyone.